All righty. <clears throat> so 1 Corinthians chapter 16, uh, for one, as I mentioned uh, in the announcements, you know, we're taking a step back from the Psalm series. So we're going to, uh, this here won't be uh, uh, an entire, um, you know, expository message on 1 Corinthians 16, but we're just going to uh, look at a couple of scriptures here. And to get the, the full context of the scripture, um, uh, the, get the full context of 1 Corinthians chapter 16, Paul here is writing to the church of Corinth, uh, the church of God at Corinth to be uh, more specific. And this chapter here begins with Paul mentioning uh, the collection for the saints at Jerusalem. There is a collection that uh, he is uh, requesting of them for the help for the saints that are in Jerusalem. And he's writing to them in advance to basically make up the collection in advance. The thing is, Paul doesn't want to show up. And then once he's there, they start gathering together the collection and everything. But he's telling them in advance that, you know, have the collection ready and uh, to lay it aside on that first day of the week. But more importantly than, you know, I just think this is interesting that Paul is not just looking to come and take the collection and be on his way. But, you know, uh, he also tells them of his plans that he planned to do once he gets there to the church of Corinth. His plan is not to just get the collection and just move on to Jerusalem, but he speaks about how he's planning to tarry with them a little while. He's planning to winter with them. If you look in verse uh, five, he says, now I will come unto you when I shall pass through Macedonia, for I do pass through Macedonia, and it may be that I will abide Yea, and winter with you. So notice that he's not looking to just come and get the collection and go, but he says, I'm looking to abide with you. I'm looking to winter with you that ye may bring me on my journey whithersoever I go. For I will not see you now by the way, but I trust to tarry a while with you if the Lord permit. So his uh, goal, his intent is not only just to get the collection, but then he wants to tarry with them a while. He say, yea, and winter with you. Well, you think about winter, Winter is about a three month span. There's a, a quarter of, uh, well, I say, uh, yes, the, a quarter of the year, right? So he's looking to spend a few months there with them. And you can just imagine what such a blessing that's going to be to that church of Corinth. I'm sure he can set some things in order that are out of order. I'm sure he would be preaching around there and he can encourage the saints and all. So it will be a blessing to that church when the Apostle Paul would come through there. I like what he said, if the Lord permit. So his plan was to get there, get the collection, and also tarry there a while, as he said, also. But he states uh, also his further plan of action. If you look at verse 8, he says, but I will tarry at Ephesus until Pentecost. And then he says here, and this is where the title of our message come. He says, for a great door and effectual is open unto me, and there are many adversaries. So he states that he's going to uh, tarry there at Ephesus until Pentecost. But then he also tells them, as the title of our message is, for a great door and effectual is open. So that's the title of our lesson this evening, a great door and effectual. And let me start off with this message um, by explaining what this message is not saying, okay? Because the thing is, with this message, uh, or I'll say this particular passage of Scripture, I have heard it many times, and uh, particularly from mainstream Christianity, where they take this Scripture and they really just turn it into something that is not even saying. Uh, most of the time, or I'll just say about 100% of the time, when I have heard this Scripture uh, preached by mainstream Christi Christianity, it, it comes off in the context of someone getting rich. It comes off in the context of someone getting wealthy or they're coming into a door that is open for them for business or, or any type of, um, you know, uh, uh, wealth that they may walk into. And, you know, here's the thing. There's nothing wrong with God opening up doors. So I would say us praying for doors to be open uh, for us to, uh, let's say, increase in our job and, and our type of work that we do on a daily basis. There's nothing wrong with that. 
There's nothing wrong. And I, I'm a personal testimony of someone who over the years have prayed and asked God to open up doors for me for employment and asking the Lord to place me somewhere where I can not only just be uh, a blessing to that company, but also be a blessing to people personally where I can get in there and lead people to Christ as well. So it's nothing wrong with if you're down on hard times and you need God to open up a door and, and uh, give you a, uh, uh, a place of employment or something where you can provide for your family. There's nothing wrong with praying to the Lord and asking him to open up those doors. But when we're talking about the context of this, we have to be careful because mainstream Christianity turned this on its head. And I've heard it many times where they're talking about God opening up doors pertaining to you getting rich, pertaining to you becoming wealthy or you starting a business. And, you know, listen, there's nothing wrong with starting a business, but let's keep the context of this scripture in its right context. Let's make sure we understand this because the context of this is not getting rich or walking through this door of opportunity where you're going to get wealthy or start some business. God's going to open up that door. That's not what the scripture is talking about. But the scripture in particular is talking about an opportunity to preach Christ's gospel. It's an opportunity to uh, preach to the lost and someone gets saved. That is what he's talking about. Now, uh, if you turn a few pages over to 2 Corinthians chapter 2, 2 Corinthians chapter 2, there's a very similar verse as well where Paul pretty much reiterates this same thing to the same church, uh, but just uh, on a different location. He was uh, in Ephesus, but he speak of a place called Troas, and he literally just about say word for word the same thing that we just seen when it comes to uh, Ephesus. Notice what he says in 2 Corinthians chapter 2. Look at verse 10. He says, to whom ye forgive anything, I forgive also. For if I forgave anything to whom I forgave it for your sake, for your sakes forgave I it in the person of Christ. Lest Satan should get an advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. Furthermore, when I came to Troas, notice this, to preach Christ's gospel, and notice these words, and a door was opened unto me of the Lord. I had no rest in my spirit because I found not Titus my brother, but taking my leave of them, I went from thence into Macedonia. So he speaks about why he is in Troas in verse 12. And he says, when I came to Troas, well, I would say at that moment when he was in Troas, he said, furthermore, when I came to Troas, notice this, to preach Christ's gospel. So what was his purpose in a Troas? To preach Christ's gospel. But then notice what he says in there at the same time. And a door was opened unto me. So is this not the same thing when you go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 16? Is that not what he said about Ephesus? But I will tarry, I will tarry at Ephesus until Pentecost, for a great door and effectual is open unto me. So what is he expecting to do in Ephesus? Well, obviously the same thing that he was doing in Troas, where he has an opportunity to preach Christ's gospel. So we see when we dive into the Bible that, you know, we get the proper context of these great doors that are open. The great doors that are opened by God are not doors of opportunity to get rich. It's not doors for you to get wealthy or start some business and it's all about you accumulating wealth. That is not what the doors are all about, but the doors are opportunities to preach Christ's gospel. That is what it's all about. So you turn back to 1 Corinthians chapter 16. Let's get an explanation here because he says for a great door, but then he uses a word that says an effectual. A great door and effectual is opened unto me. For one, what does it mean to, uh, for something to be effectual? Well, looking up this word here in the, uh, in the dictionary, it says successful in producing a desired or intended result. And then it uh, just, simply just says effective. So keep this in mind as we going through this lesson here that effectual means to be successful in producing a desired or intended result. So whatever your intents are, whatever that is, when you are producing results in those in that intended result, you are being effective. You are making a difference. And I like how Paul states here 
He says a great door, but then he says, and it's effectual. He's saying that door is effectual because you just think about this. Since we know what the great door is, the great door is the opportunity to preach Christ's gospel. But then he's saying when it comes to preaching the, Christ, the gospel of Christ, he's saying that it is effectual as well. And if you just think about that, you know, if you preach the gospel of Christ, you will be successful. You will be effective. It's, it's a guarantee. You know, if you're saved, if you are reading your Bible, if you are memorizing the scriptures, if you are prepared to preach the gospel, if you are ready to preach the gospel, if you're willing to go out, if you're singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, if you're making melodies in your heart unto the Lord and everything, if you if you have all that going on, it's a guarantee that you will be effectual at preaching Christ's gospel. You will be effectual. You will be effective. You will produce Results. Mark chapter 16, you don't have to turn there, but the Bible says, and they went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word with signs following. Amen. So here's the thing. How can I like what I like about that scripture is that he says the Lord working with them, the Lord working with them and confirming the word with signs following. Amen. So when they went out, when the Lord Jesus Christ instructed them to go out and preach in that in that first in that early church when they went out they didn't go alone but they had the holy ghost working with them now here's the question how can you not be effective how can you not make a difference when you have the holy ghost working with you you know the bible says that we are laborers together with God. The Bible says that we are his husbandry. Listen, if we have God teaming up with us, laboring with us, you will be effectual. You will be effective. A couple other scriptures that say the same thing, how when we preach Christ's gospel, we will be effectual. The Bible says in Psalm chapter 126, verse 5, they that sow in tears shall reap in joy. He that goeth forth and weepeth, bearing precious seed, notice this, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. So notice what he says, shall doubtless come again. Well, what is that basically saying? You're going to be effective. You're going to make a difference. You will make changes out there in people's lives. You shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. Now, here's the thing. This is not to say that everyone you speak with will get saved. That's not what it's saying, you know, but at least here's the thing. If you don't go out and get if you if you go out and you don't get people saved, that doesn't mean that you're not being effectual. It does not mean that you're not making a difference out there. You know, here's the thing that you can take that you are warning all men. You know, the Bible speaks, Paul speaks about how he has warned all men. That is something that we can look at that. Listen, just because someone may not have gotten saved, it doesn't mean that we're not making a difference. We're still making a difference. We're still producing results. We're still doing what God has intended for us to do. We're still effectual. So Paul says there is a great door and effectual open unto me. And I would say not just only to Paul. But even to us today, here in America, here in the state of Georgia, there is an effectual door. There's a great door open and effectual unto us as well. You know, living in America, there is there. If you compare, you know, how we live today compared to that early church and all the beatings and scourges and and many things that they went through to preach Christ's gospel. You see that whatever we go through today is no comparison is no comparison. So, you know, today we do have a great door. We do have a great opportunity. We can be effectual uh, because we don't have many other hindrances that they had back then. You know, right now, compared to what we read in the Bible and how, how they went through their trials and tribulations, you know, this would be probably considered a time of peace right now compared to what they went through. Now is the time. Today is the day of salvation. Now is the time that we can preach the gospel and there are many doors out there uh, that we can walk through and be effectual at that. So let's get into the points of the message here. Let's get into the points. You know, when it comes to these great doors and effectual, as I mentioned, not only to Paul, where he's talking about, when he says, you know, a great door is, is, is open, 
a uh, great door and effectual is open unto me. Not just Paul, but as I mentioned to us as well, there is something that we need to understand about these great doors and effectual. Let's get an understanding that number one, here's the statement number one about a great door and effectual is that when it comes to these great doors, there will be adversaries. There will be, I, I correct that, there will be many adversaries. Notice what he say in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 9. He says, for a great door and effectual is open unto me. But then notice this, in the same verse, and there are many adversaries. A great door and effectual is open unto me, and there are many adversaries. Now, someone can look at that and say, well, that's a contradiction right there. How can it be an open door, but then yet there are many adversaries? Some would even say, well, that's an oxymoron right there, right? If someone was to say, well, what's an oxymoron? Oxymoron is a figure of speech in which apparently contradictory terms appear in conjunction. So we see that very same thing in the same sentence here. Once again, a figure of speech in which apparently contradictory terms appear. They appear in conjunction. So here's the thing. This seems to appear like it's a contradiction here because he says a great door and effectual is open unto me. But then he says, and there are many adversaries. Well, well how can it be opened unto you if, if there is an opportunity for you to just walk through that door and preach Christ's gospel? How, how can that be if there are many adversaries? Well, let's look a little further. You know, when you think about that great door, and, and that chance to be effectual, it, it is a great door, but this, with this chance comes adversaries. And you would think that it's a door of opportunity. I, I, I will be effective. I can be effectual. I can walk up to just anybody. I can go to any city. I can go to any apartment complex. I can go anywhere, and I can just preach freely because we look at today in America, there is a great door that's open. There is a great door that's effectual unto us. Open and effectual. So what's this thing about the adversaries? Well, let's look at what the Bible says because that is the truth of the matter, that when you strive to do work for God, it will bring many adversaries. First Thessalonians, flip over a few pages. First Thessalonians chapter 1. We're going to see the consistency of this, of this very statement here, how when preaching the gospel, yeah, you can have that open door, but then expect that there is going to be many adversaries. First Thessalonians chapter 2, look at verse 1 through 2. The Bible says, For yourselves, brethren, know our entrance in unto you, that it was not in vain. But even after that, we had suffered before and were shamefully entreated, as ye know, at Philippi, we were bold in our God to speak unto you the gospel of God with much contention. So notice what he says in verse one. He's uh, yeah, in verse one. He's speaking about their entrance, that how they uh, were among them, the church uh, well in the area of Thessalonica. When he came upon them, notice what he says. That our entrance, he says, uh, for yourselves, brethren, know our entrance in unto you that it was not in vain. Well, what does he mean that it was not in vain? Well, he's saying, well, we made a difference around there. We were effectual around there. We produce results around there. People got saved around there. We didn't just, you know, we didn't just come around it. Even for those who didn't get saved, they were still producing results because they were still warning men. So he's saying our entrance un in unto you that it was not in vain. He's saying, yeah, we, we produce results. We were effectual. But then in verse 2, he says, but even after that, we had suffered before. And were shamefully entreated, as ye know, at Philippi, we were bold in our God to speak unto you the gospel of God, notice this, with much contention. Well, what does he mean with much contention? That means that he had many adversaries. He had many people contending against him and trying to stop the gospel from being spread. So there we see again where, yeah, that door was open, but then it brought many adversaries as well. Turn one book over to 2 Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 1 through 3. Once again, 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 1 through 3 says, Finally, brethren, pray for us that the word of the Lord may have free course and be glorified, 
even as it is with you, and that we may be delivered from unreasonable and wicked men. For all men have not faith, but the Lord is faithful who shall establish you and keep you from evil. Amen. So notice what he says in verse 1. He, speak, he speaks about praying that the church would pray for them, that the word of the Lord may have free course. Well, what is he talking about free course? He's talking about being able to preach without distractions, being able to preach without anyone trying to hinder them. And let me just pause and insert. This is something on the Monday group as those who uh, attend the Monday group, that this is something that I often tend to pray for. And not just uh, me, but other people I'm sure pray for as well, that when we're going out to preach the gospel, that we can preach with free course, that we won't have any distractions. And you think about all the distractions that can come up. Well, how about, you know, when you're speaking with someone and they, uh, you know, they have to get on the phone. They have to take a phone call. Or let's say they have a friend who's trying to pull them away. Uh, it, it's many things, or they can say, oh, you know, I got something on the stove. I, I have to get to this, and I have to cook. You know, there are many things that while you're preaching the gospel can become a hindrance. So he's saying, pray for us that we can preach, you know, with, with free course, that there's no distractions. But then notice what he say. In verse 2, he says, and that we may be delivered, notice this, from unreasonable and wicked men. Unreasonable. He just talked about people who you cannot reason with. People that it's just going to go over their head. They're going to fight against everything that you say. They won't be able to comprehend anything that you say. They just look into just uh, cause a problem. He says uh, that you pray for us. He's asking them to pray for them and that we may be delivered from unreasonable and wicked men. Well, notice that this is in the context of them preaching the gospel, because when you preach the word of God, it's going to bring many adversaries, as he said in 1 Corinthians, verse, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 16, where we were looking at. I'm going, you don't have to turn here, but I want to tie in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. This uh, chapter here, Paul is making a defense of, uh, for the resurrection, I would say, because there were some who said that there was no resurrection. And he spends a, a, uh, that entire chapter, it's a lengthy chapter, one of my favorite chapters of the Bible, where he is taking the time to defend the resurrection. And in his defense statement, he says in verse 31, he says, I protest by your rejoicing, which I have in Christ Jesus our Lord. I die daily. Notice this, he says, if after the manner of men I have fought with beasts at Ephesus, what advantageth it me if the dead rise not? Let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. And I like what he said in verse 32. He says, if after the manner of men I have fought with beasts at Ephesus, what advantageth it me? He's saying, what profit? Why did I need to go through all that if, if the dead rise not? Why did I go through fighting with beasts at Ephesus? Well, when he says, you know, when he says fighting with beasts at Ephesus, he's not talking about fighting off pit bulls and German shepherds and, and little poodles, those type of beasts that may come up while you're trying to preach the gospel. But, no, he's talking about people and these wicked people, and he actually calls them beasts. He's calling them animals. You know, and he says, if after the manner of men I have fought with beasts at Ephesus, what advantage it, it me if the dead rise not? So if the dead rise not, all this, this fighting and, and all these enemies uh, of God that I am coming up against and all these people that are adversaries of the gospel, if the dead rise not, me doing all that, what, what does it profit? Philippians 3.18, you don't have to turn here, but he says, For many walk of whom I have told you often and now tell you even weeping that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ. You can turn with me over to 2 Timothy chapter 4. 2 Timothy chapter 4. Second Timothy chapter four. Look at verse 14. Paul says, as he's writing to Timothy, Alexander, the coppersmith did me much evil. The Lord reward him according to his works of whom be thou where also 
for he had greatly withstood our words. And my first answer, no man stood with me, but all men forsook me. I pray God that it may not be laid to their charge. Notwithstanding, the Lord stood with me and strengthened me that by that by me, the preaching might be fully known and that all the Gentiles might hear. And I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion and the Lord shall deliver me from every evil work and will preserve me unto his heavenly kingdom to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. So we're looking at the scripture when Paul is writing to Timothy and he's telling Timothy to be on guard. There's this guy that obviously they both know because he just tells him Alexander the coppersmith did me much evil. You know, he don't have to say, hey, you know that guy, Alexander? No, this, this guy, Alexander the coppersmith, is well known to a point that he just calls him, hey, make sure you know about this guy. He's the coppersmith. You know, Alexander the coppersmith did me much evil. So he's warning him, listen, be aware of this guy, because in verse 15, he says, of whom be thou aware also, for he had greatly withstood our words. Well, Paul is there preaching the word of God, and he's saying, listen, Alexander the coppersmith is causing me much evil. He's doing me, he's causing many problems, and I want you to be aware of this as well. And then he mentions in verse 17 uh, how uh, that he was at the end, latter end of that, he says, I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion. Now, here's the thing. Was Paul really about to get bitten by a lion? Was he really like, you know, in a situation where Daniel was in the lion's den? Yeah, Daniel actually did have a, was in a lion's den. So he did have lions surrounding him. But Paul here, when he says, I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion, He's not talking about actually physical lions, but he's comparing once more these men to animals. These people who are trying to stop the word and they're there as adversaries, as he called them beasts at Ephesus. He's calling them here a lion, another beast as well. He's stating here that they are there to cause much evil and the Lord is delivering him from the hands of these wicked people. And in verse 18, he says, and the Lord shall deliver me from every evil work. And I'm only bringing this out to see the consistency that when you have a great door and it is open unto you and it is effectual, just like he said in the scripture, take note that there will be, as he said, and there are many adversaries. Because when you look to do a great work for God, expect the adversaries to come. And let's make a quick application today. You know, there, just like it was back then, I'm sure there are many adversaries of people today who are looking to stop the gospel. You know, you could be in a, in a neighborhood where, you know, it's a gated community and someone, and, and let me be clear on this, you know, that just because someone come out of you in a private community, this gated community and everything, just because someone come out and they say, hey, you know, you're not supposed to be here preaching. This is a private residence. You know, be careful of having that talk. Oh, this reprobate came out, you know, and, and tried to stop the gospel. That person is an enemy of the gospel because they're trying to stop us. Well, here's the thing. A lot of people do things ignorantly. And that does not mean they are necessarily enemies of God. Especially if it's just someone who's just telling you that, hey, you know, normally we don't have this on the premises, you know, and they just maybe not aware. But that doesn't make them an enemy. That doesn't make them some reprobate because they in their eyes, they're looking as if they're doing their job. But do understand that there are people who know what they're doing, who know that they are enemies of God, who know that they are an adversary to the gospel and they have intentions to really stop you from preaching. I heard many stories about people who uh, move on from some crazy person who is there trying to cause havoc. They leave that door, go to the next door, and that person is there following them through the neighborhood. They're causing havoc. Okay, that person right there is an adversary. You know, if, if the, it would have been fine if they just said, I didn't want it, you know, no thank you and close the door. But when they go back in the house and they put on their shoes and coat and everything, and they're coming out to follow you and they're looking to stir up havoc. Yeah, that's somebody who is an adversary to the gospel. So here's the thing. We should expect that when there are open doors, when there's a great door and effectual open unto us, Understand and make sure we take note that there will be many 
adversaries, as Paul mentions there in the scripture. So that's statement number one, that there are many adversaries when it comes to these great doors. Number two, here's the number two statement. Not all doors will be open unto you. Not all doors will be open unto you. Turn to Acts chapter 16. And when you and while you turn there, I'm going to turn to Acts chapter 26. And Acts chapter 26, Paul is, um, you know, telling King Agrippa about his Damascus Road experience and the words that the Lord Jesus told him as he was pretty much putting him into the ministry. And notice what he say here in Acts chapter 26, verse 14. He says, and when we were all fallen to the earth, I heard a voice speaking unto me and saying in the Hebrew tongue, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And I said, who art thou, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. But rise and stand upon thy feet, for I have appeared unto thee for this purpose. Notice this. This is the purpose that the Lord chose Paul. Notice this. To make thee a minister and a witness, both of these things which thou hast seen, and of those things in the which I will appear unto thee, delivering thee from the people and from the Gentiles unto whom now I send thee to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them, which are sanctified by faith that is in me. Amen. So this is what Paul is telling King Agrippa that on that day, on my Damascus Road experience, this is what the Lord told me that he is sending me to be a minister and a witness, both of these, uh, of both of these things which thou hast seen and of those things in the which I will appear unto thee. He's saying I'm sending you to the Gentiles. He's saying for you to open up their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God. He's saying this is what Christ told me. Now keep that in mind that that is what the Lord told him. Paul here has a green light, but as I mentioned, understand that when it comes to these open doors, not all doors will be opened unto you. You say, well, that's an oxymoron. How, how, that's another oxymoron. How can that be? If I have an open door, how is it that not all doors will be open unto me then? Because Paul say here that the Lord is sending me to the Gentiles. Wouldn't you think that Paul would just walk in any, be able to go any and everywhere and can preach anywhere he want? And there will be no issue. Well, here's the thing. As I mentioned, not all doors will be open unto you, although there is a great door that is open unto you. Not all doors will be open unto you. Acts chapter 16. Notice this in verse 6. The Bible says this is uh, Luke talking and he's talking about their their missionary journey and, and their trips as they're traveling about. Luke says here now when they had gone throughout Phrygia and the region of Galatia, notice this, and were forbidden of the Holy Ghost to preach the word in Asia. Notice this. After they were come to Mycenae, they essayed to go into Bithynia. But the spirit suffered them not. So we see two times where, yes, Paul received the Lord Jesus Christ mission to go and preach the gospel to all the Gentiles. But we see where he is a saying he is attempting to go into certain areas. But those doors are not open unto him. Those doors are forbidden. Verse six says that the Holy Ghost forbid him to go to that region. And then it said that he essayed. Well, what is that in verse 7 when he says that they essayed to go into Bithynia? Well, the essay is talking about that was their plan. That was their attempt to go over here. And then guess what? That door is closed. So we see that although he has a green light from the Lord to go and preach everywhere, we see that not all doors are open unto him. And someone can say, oh, that's a contradiction. That's a contradiction. 
No, we have to understand that sometime, although those doors are open unto you, some doors are just not open unto you. And that's just how it is. And most people say, well, that's a contradiction. No, it's not. Let's get a little further in this. Notice what Paul says as he's writing to the church of, of, of Colossus. In Colossians chapter 4, you don't have to turn out. You can if you want. But Colossians chapter 4, verse 2 says, Paul says here to the church, continue in prayer and watching the same with thanksgiving. Notice this, with all praying also for us that God would open unto us a door of utterance to speak the mystery of Christ for which I am also in bonds. Well, there it is again, you know, going back to where we got the original context of what these doors are. He's talking about here again how they should pray that God will open unto us a door of utterance. What's that door of utterance? To speak the mystery of Christ, for which I am also in bonds. He says here, that I may make it manifest as I ought to speak. Now, here's the thing. It only stands to reason that Paul understands that, yes, I have a green light to go and preach everywhere, but he also understands that not every door, not every opportunity is open unto me. If that was the case, what is the purpose of this scripture? If all doors are just open unto him, why is he praying? Why is he soliciting the prayers of the saints of this church to pray that God will open up a door of utterance to speak the mystery of Christ? Well, because sometimes some doors, although, yeah, you have that green light, although there's a great door, not every door is going to be opened unto you. <clears throat> so as I mentioned, we see in, in Acts, uh, let's go back to Acts chapter 16, it, just in case you left there. But Acts chapter 16 You know, here's the thing that we could, can glean off here, that <clears throat> although we see these doors are closing, that these doors are not open unto him, we're seeing where Paul is attempting, at least attempting, to go to other cities and preach. But those doors are not open. As I mentioned here, verse 6, it says that, he was forbidden. He said, forbidden of the Holy Ghost to preach the word in Asia. Verse 7 says, after they were come to Mycenae, they assayed to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit suffered them not. And, you know, this is something that I like about the scripture, that the fact that, yes, the Holy Ghost forbid them, but at least there was an attempt there. At least there was some form of a saying, some form of, of plan where they say, you know what, we got to hit this area. We have to go there. And the Holy Ghost is saying, no, nah, no, nah, not there. I don't need you there. I need you over here. I need you in this area here. And, you know, this is something that we ought to take and, and be mindful of because it's easy to look at a neighborhood and just say, you know what, man, that neighborhood is, is fancy, it's rich. And then you just say, ah, let's just move somewhere else. Well, 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 wait a minute. Did you at least have a plan to get in there? Did you at least attempt? Because Paul and, and, and the crew here, they are a saying, they are attempting, and then they're being forbidden of the Holy Ghost. So, you know, even when you see a rough area, you know, a rough area, someone say, oh, man, the west side of Atlanta, oh, I don't know about that. Bankhead, oh, don't go to Bankhead. Well, well here's the thing. Did you at least a say, did you at least attempt? You know, don't just shut down an opportunity before you even attempt to get over there. At least attempt to walk through that open door. <clears throat> and, you know, make sure that we're not taking the scapegoat to avoid attempting to walk through that door. You know, because the scapegoat can be, oh, man, that person looks mean. Or that person has a reputation. I mean, here's one that, you know, is just kind of a classic example. The guy with the tattoos in the face, you know, and tattoos everywhere. And the biker guys, the Harley guys or so, and uh, the gang members. It's a, a gang of, as they say, thugs on the corner or uh, so. And, 
and you know, it's easy to just look at it and say it's, it's, it's rough around the edges. That person just looked like this and they may not be receptive. Well, here's the question. Can you at least assay? Can you at least make the attempt? As Paul and Silas, they are making the attempt to go there, but the Holy Spirit is saying no. So here's the thing. Don't just look for a scapegoat by saying, oh, they look. No, make the attempt before you just deem that door as, oh, that's a door that's not open. Well, why was it not open? Oh, they look how they look. So we have to be careful not to take <clears throat> that approach. As Paul and Silas, they assayed that team there, they assayed to go into these regions, but they were for, forbidden. So we see that although, yes, there's a great door, Yes, there are many adversaries. Yeah, but also understand that every door will not be open unto you. But then here's the third statement. The third statement here is that just because the door is not open for you does not mean that it's not open for others. Just because that opportunity is forbidden for you does not mean that it's forbidden for everybody, that nobody can get to this. If you're still there in Acts chapter 16, yes, Paul had doors that were not open unto him. The, the Bible says in verse 7, in verse 7, notice this. At verse 7, the end of verse 7 says, after they were come to Mycenae, they essayed to go to into Bithynia. Notice this, but the, but the Spirit suffered, notice this word, them not. But the Spirit suffered them not. Well, take notice of that. Because, yes, the Holy Spirit is forbidding them, particular, particularly them from going into the region. Does that mean that God forbid it, everybody from going into that region? Well, not so. Well, how do we know that? Well, look at verse 6. It says, now, when they had gone throughout Phrygia and the region of Galatia, and were forbidden of the Holy Ghost to preach the word in Asia. Well, notice this. They were forbidden to preach the word here in this area of, of Asia. But how many churches do we see that actually sprung up in this region, including Galatians? There's the churches of Galatia. We have the book of Galatians. So, yes, although verse 7 says that the Spirit suffered them not, the, the Spirit did not allow them to go into this region. It does not mean that the Lord just closed all doors in this region. And, you know, I like to use uh, any time, you know, what, what came to me when I was uh, preparing this message, that word right there, it got me at the end, the statement there, excuse me, where he says, but the Spirit suffered them not. It, it made me think about Romans chapter 16, because Romans chapter 16 gives a list of people who did great works for God. These people have no letter written unto them, like the epistle to Timothy, you know, or to Philemon. They have no, uh, no, uh, the average person in there does not have a, a letter written to them. Their name most likely is only, you know, mentioned that one time in the Bible. But we see in that chapter, Romans chapter 16, that Paul is just giving all these shout outs to these people who have labored and have been co-laborers with him in the gospel. You know, and it just shows you that, yeah, some doors may have been closed for Paul, but it was not closed for them. And, you know, I like to just think about someone like Barnabas and Mark, because we know leaving the church of Antioch in the book of Acts, who was sent out of the church of Antioch to go on this missionary journey was Paul and Barnabas. And then as they uh, take Mark with them, of course, when they go into uh, this, uh, their first city, one of their first cities, I would say, they run into some issues. Uh, I believe that's the one with Bar Jesus and, and that situation. But Mark goes back. And then, of course, when they're about to go on their next journey, Barnabas and Paul have this fallout. And then you don't hear much about Barnabas at all anymore after that. It's like a focus, a shift to Paul from there on. But here's the thing. Just because he broke off from Barnabas does not mean that Barnabas just ceased from working. It doesn't mean that Barnabas did no more work for God. 
And here's how I believe Barnabas was really effective because Barnabas and Mark, obviously he took Mark and they became a team. But at the end of Paul's uh, life, as he's writing, well, I would say close to the end of his life, as he's writing to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 4, he says, take Mark as he's asking it. And he's saying, you know, bring the books, bring the parchments. But then he says, take Mark and bring him with thee. Notice this. He says, for he is profitable to me for the ministry. Well, at one point in time, Mark was not profitable. That's why he did not want to bring him on the journey. But later on, he is profitable to the ministry. And I believe it's only because with him working with Barnabas, he really got solid. He really got firm in, in preaching the gospel and doing the work of God to, to the point where, where Paul is saying, yeah, bring him. He's beneficial. I could use him right now. Bring him on. So I just bring that out because, you know, not to have this thought that just because the door is closed, you know, for someone, it, it, it doesn't mean that that person will never get an opportunity. No, it may be closed for you, but it doesn't mean it's closed for everyone else. As we see in Romans chapter 16, where many people are listed out as doing great things for God. Turn, at, uh, uh, turn to Luke chapter 8. Luke chapter 8. You know, this is a situation that happened to the Lord Jesus Christ where a door was closed on the Lord Jesus Christ. He essayed, he attempted to go into this region, but the doors were closed. Luke chapter 8. This is the, the famous story of the man, you know, the Lord Jesus asked him, what is his name, what, what is your name? He says, Legion, for we are many. When this man is healed and the Lord Jesus Christ drives these demons out of him, in verse 35, in the story, the Bible says here in Luke chapter 8, verse 35, it says, Then they went out to see what was done and came to Jesus and found the man of, out of whom the devils were departed, sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. Notice this, and it says, they also, which saw it, told him by what means he that was possessed of the devils was healed. Then the whole multitude of the country of the gatherings round about besought him to depart from them, for they were taken with great fear, and he went up into the ship and returned back again. So in verse 26, the Bible speaks about Jesus. It says, and they arrived at the country of the Gadarenes, which is over against Galilee. So the Lord Jesus Christ is coming into this area. He's looking to do some work. He's not there to just twindle his fingers. He's coming there, obviously, to seek and save that which was lost. He's coming over there to bring some light over into this, uh, into this region. But verse 37 says that the whole multitude of the country of the Gadarenes round about besought him to depart. So notice how he essayed, he attempted, but then the door was shut on him because they asked him, they're, they're telling him depart. They besought him to depart from them. And then it says, for they were taken with great fear and he went up into the ship and returned back again. And then notice this, now the man out of whom the devils were departed besought him that he might be with him. But Jesus sent him away saying, notice these words, return to thy own house and show how great things God hath done unto thee. And he went his way and published throughout the whole city how great things Jesus had done unto him. So notice how the door that Jesus essayed to go through, that door was closed on him, but then the door was actually opened for this guy here. And we know that it was open because when the Lord tells him to go back, and show how great things God hath done unto thee, the Bible says, and he went his way and published throughout the whole city how great things Jesus had done unto him. You know, and that's a great scripture to show that, you know, as the Bible say, show how great things God hath done unto thee. And then the Holy Spirit says here, he went and showed the city how great things Jesus had done unto him. There's a good scripture pointing that how Jesus is God. All right, another another. Uh, sermon for another day, right? But we see that he went to the whole city and he published throughout the city 
This city that the Lord Jesus Christ couldn't get to because that door was closed on him because they besought him to get away. That same city that had the doors closed on him, it was open for someone else. And, you know, someone can say, well, it didn't say that, you know, that he went and got people saved. Yeah, but listen, he published the great things that Jesus done for him. You know, he did what the Lord told him to do. That was a great door. He was effectual, like we say. Even if you're just warning men, you're still making a difference. You're still effectual. And let's make a quick application here. You know, when it comes to friends and family, we have to understand that, listen, it is our duty to make the attempt, to make sure that we uh, say, that we are saying, we are attempting to get that person saved. Make sure that you do your due diligence to make sure that they get an opportunity to hear the gospel first. But then here is the hope that just because that door is shut on you and they don't listen to you does not mean that they won't listen to anyone else. You know, and this is why it's good to pray for laborers. Pray for laborers that God will send more laborers into the harvest. Because you know what? You may have a family member that you cannot get to. And just because they, you know, they may not hear you out. Mainly, let's just say for an obvious reason. Because they know your background. They know your background. They knew how you grew up. And now you're this holy roller. Now you're this Bible thumper. Now you're trying to get everyone saved. You know, they may look at that and say, oh, well, I know how you used to live. And they may close that door. They may say, no, nah, I don't want to hear. But listen, if you're praying for laborers and asking God to send another soul winner that way that that person may get saved, listen, there is hope there. And that's why we ought to be praying that God send more laborers into the harvest. And, you know, this also gives us hope when it comes to our loved ones that we have friends or family that we may bring to church because yes, you know, as you know, a, a person who brings someone to church, you know, make sure you do your due diligence to make sure you get your loved ones saved. Make sure you get an opportunity to talk to them. But then here's the blessed hope of that. And especially being in a church like this, that listen, if you bring them here, there's a great chance that they may just leave saved because there are many people here who can preach the gospel. So, you know, make sure that you are a saint. Make sure that you're making the attempt to get your loved ones saved. But then, you know, you bring them here. Make sure that we, as the people of God here at this church, are doing our due diligence to greet the guests and make sure that, listen, they have an opportunity uh, to get saved. And, you know, here's another thing. Don't assume that just because someone brought their, fr their friends or their family to church, don't assume that they have given that person the gospel or made the attempt. You know, it's very easy to say, oh, that person's a soul winner. Brother such and such or sister such and such is a soul winner, and I know that they gave them the gospel, so I don't even have to ask that person. I can just go over and just say, hey, how you doing? Don't, don't just assume just because a saved person bring their friends or family member to church, don't just assume that they have attempted already to give them the gospel. It could be where they have attempted and that door was closed. But here's an opportunity where they may not have heard them out, but they may hear you out as well. You know, so it's good, you know, uh, to, to be aware of, of situations like that and, and making sure that we present people an opportunity as, as, you know, guests come through that we give them an opportunity to hear the gospel. And, you know, here's another point that I want to touch on before I move on to the next one. You know, when it comes to bringing loved ones, you know, friends and family, you know, don't get offended if someone asks your friend or family member about their salvation. Don't get offended because most people, they'll bring them and then, you know, they can have, oh, oh they're, they're saved already. They're, and, and usually it could come from something like as far as fear or maybe some form of embarrassment where it's like, oh, you're embarrassing my guests. Listen, don't be offended if, some, if you bring a, a guest in here and someone is caring enough to ask your guests if they have received that free gift 
of eternal life and how they know that they're on their way to heaven. Don't be offended if someone is looking to help you out where that door might have been closed, but guess what? It can be open for someone else. So point number three, just because the door is not open unto you does not mean that it's not open for others. But here's the last point here, very short point, that when it comes to great doors, a great door that is open, a great door and effectual that is open, the fourth point here is that we have to be sure that when it comes to this, that prayers are to be made for doors to be open. Prayers should be made for those doors to be opened. You can turn back to Colossians chapter 4. Now, I'm not going to spend long on these at all. I'm going to just probably touch on them briefly. But Colossians chapter 4, let me get there myself. Paul, while he's in prison, you know, when you're in prison, you know, I'm sure some humanity can kick in where you're afraid, especially when you are uh, in, the, in, in prison for Paul's purposes. He's in the prison because of what he's preaching. And there is, I'm sure, a, you know, human side of you that starts to say, man, is what I'm doing wrong? Uh, uh, should I quit? Should I, should I stop? Is it really worth it? Well, we have to be sure and, and have an understanding that prayers should be made for doors to be opened. Colossians chapter 4, verse 2 through 4, it says, Continue in prayer and watch in the same with thanksgiving, with all praying also for us that God would open unto us a door of utterance. There he is there where he is soliciting the prayers of the church. Pray for us that doors would be opened. Ephesians chapter 6 Ephesians chapter 6, verse 18, he says, Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. Notice this, and for me, that utterance may be given unto me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in bonds, that therein I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. So there again, he is soliciting the prayers of the church of Ephesus as well. First, the Colossians, now the Ephesians. He's just soliciting prayers everywhere and saying, listen, pray for me. Pray that I can have the utterance. Pray that a door will be open. Pray that the Lord will give me boldness because he mentions here that I'm in prison. And it's easy when you're in a situation like Paul to kind of dumb it down and say, I, I think I'm going to back off that subject. I think I'm going to uh, kind of. Uh, go another direction and, and maybe soften up and stop talking about the Lord Jesus Christ. It's easy to take that route. Second Thessalonians chapter three. This is the very last uh, scripture for tonight. Second Thessalonians chapter three. Second Thessalonians chapter three, verse one through two says, finally, brethren, pray for us that the word of the Lord may have free course and be glorified, even as it is with you. And that we may be delivered from unreasonable and wicked men, for all men have not faith. So there he is again where he's saying to the church of the Thessalonians, pray for us that the word of the Lord, that the word of the Lord may have free course. And, you know, keep in mind to pray for other people, you know, to pray for other people's boldness and be praying for those doors to be open, you know, especially if, you know, uh, uh, let's say it's a day, you know, where you're not going out soul winning and we have our bulletin and you see that there's a soul winning time going on that day. You know, you may not be a saint. You may not be attempting that day, but at least pray for those that are going out. At least pray for that. The Lord will give them boldness. At least pray that God will give them free course. Something that I noticed uh, many times over the past couple of years in our bulletins. Every now and every now and then, uh, what reaches the prayer list is loved ones of, of people going back to visit loved ones to at their hometown or so. They're going back home, and they are soliciting our prayers. 
because they're going back home. They're looking to preach to their mom. They're looking to preach to their dad. They're looking to preach to their family, their cousins and, and uncles. And what they do is put in the bulletin and, and ask, pray for our boldness. Pray that, you know, we can preach with free course. Pray that we can get them alone, away from distractions, and we can give them the gospel. But not only that, they put in there, you know, that pray that we can have enough boldness to do it. Because it can be very intimidating. You get around your family, you will say to do it, you attempt to do it, but then you get around them and you're just like, oh, you're looking for every excuse. Oh, they're busy. Oh, they, they're doing this. Oh, everybody's doing this. You know what? It is important that we pray for one another because those fears can creep in, you know. So we have to be mindful. You know, uh, I wanted to touch on this because, as I mentioned, this is a, one of those uh, scriptures that I heard just twisted uh, from mainstream Christianity. And um, I, I really felt that it was a good one to, to touch on because we see this many times where, yes, uh, the Apostle Paul is going out preaching and there's adversaries, you know, and let's be mindful that with us, we're preaching the gospel, there will be adversaries everywhere. There's going to be enemies when we desire to preach the word of God. Not only that, as I mentioned, is that, you know, uh, not every door will be open unto you. Not all doors are open unto you, but thirdly, just because the doors are not open unto you doesn't mean that they won't be open for someone else. And what we ought to be doing for that someone else is praying for their boldness, praying that God will give them uh, the, the boldness and utterance to preach his gospel. Uh, let's have a word of prayer. Lord God, we thank you uh, for your word here. Thank you for these uh, examples, Lord God. We ask, Lord, that you would um, help us, Lord, to uh, continue to preach the gospel, Lord, and in spite of these dark times, Lord, help us, Lord, to ramp it up, Lord God, and and look to walk through those uh, great doors. And Lord, I, I believe and know, Father, and am a witness that when we preach the gospel, Lord, we are effectual, Lord. This church has done a great work in this area and in surrounding states, Lord God. And Lord, these doors have been open unto us and uh, they have been effectual. We have gone into other towns and, and been able to produce results and everything, Lord. So we thank you for those opportunities for the opportunities and the resources that you have blessed us with to do those things. We ask that you would help us to continue, Lord God. Uh, bless us as we leave this evening as well, and uh, give us your traveling grace and mercy, Lord God. In Jesus' name, amen.